All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, this is an, uh, part of the advocacy training series that Sierra Club um, is doing in Colorado about following up with volunteers and continuing engagement. So just a quick introduction of me. My name is Kimberly Pope. I'm a campaign representative for the Southwest region for the Our Wild America campaign, working to protect public lands um, in the beautiful Western part of the country. Uh, our agenda today, so we're just gonna go over things like why do we want volunteers to stay engaged? Why do we wanna keep them coming back? Um, how did you get here? How did you join the Sierra Club as a volunteer? Um, best practices for working with volunteers and continuing their engagement. And then also we'll have a little question and answer session. So first things first, just a popcorn. Why would we want volunteers to stick around? Why do we want them to stick around here at the Sierra Club? Any thoughts? I would say because both in politics and in nature, a lot of things work more slowly uh, on a bigger time spectrum. So if you're really interested in something, you have to be patient and be willing to stick around to actually make a difference in either one of those things. Yeah. And yeah, I would say like similar thing and also just that like as people get more involved in a certain cause or project, they like feel more invested in it or like I've heard the word ownership and I think that comes with time and you can get a lot more done um, or potentially better work done the longer and more passionate um, you've been involved with something. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like volunteers, there's an institutional knowledge to volunteers that have been working on something for a while. I think that's that's important. Any other thoughts? All right, cool. Updated a few of our thoughts here. Uh, going into the next um, slide, is how did you get here? Think about how you got here. Um, you know, each of you got to this training, became volunteers somehow. So what was the process that got you here? What was the first touch? So some examples of that are you got a text. Texting has been very popular recently for advocacy campaigns. Um, you got an email and you signed up to go to an event or um, something like that or some more traditional ways. Um, you got a phone call, um, you got phone banked by someone, um, you saw something on social media, or back before, uh, before COVID times, we used to do in-person one-on-one meetings or um, events, or we did outings, taking people out to the public lands that we wanna protect. So there's lots of different ways to, to initiate and get people involved as volunteers. Um, so my question for y'all, is how did you get here? What was the recruitment process like that got you to volunteering with the Sierra Club? Love to hear from both of you. I guess I can go first. So I got first got involved after um, finding out about it after the group did like a trivia um virtual trivia as part of Colorado Public Lands Day. Um, and that I just found out because I was running um, my program at my university's like social media. Um, so I was trying to like help other people stay informed about things going on um, in the local area or in the state. And yeah, I did that trivia and um, wanted to give back <laughs> because from what I had gotten from that night as well as just um, was something that 
you know, I had been interested for a while in getting back involved with volunteering and specifically with an environmental organization. Um, and it actually, everything being virtual kind of worked out in my favor, um, getting involved uh, over the summer and things like that. Um, yeah, and I guess the Didn't you win trivia? Didn't you win? I did, yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, and, that, and that was another thing too the, the trivia was kind of cool and like could see like from just the focus of, of the topics being discussed kind of the like what the group was thinking about um, and liked that there was mention of you know indigenous communities from this space and things like that So so things that like I guess would have like made me like traditionally wary of a large older organization like the Sierra club um, saw that they were already starting to kind of like grapple with how the organization was, you know, run in the past and things like that. Um, yeah. And I guess, uh, Apart from this specific training, I've gone to um, originally got involved by talking with Kim on the phone and have gone to a few monthly trainings. Um, I also at one point wrote a letter to the editor and that was apart from the team, but just from getting, I can't remember if it was a text or a phone call. Um, and then in terms of volunteering with other organizations I think in the past I would have considered myself a person who volunteered a lot but it was through like a volunteer sort of society that did more of like single day events which I think can be great for certain projects like a big cleanup or something like that um but aren't always as great for the things that need to be long term and I think I've generally like why I've left certain organizations has more had to do with moving and, and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly being able to do things virtually kind of helps with some of that as well. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, what about you, Amber Lee? You haven't been here a while. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I can't, seem to keep away even if things fall off every once in a while because life definitely comes up but um I I mean I originally started out um I would say I, I mean I think I just followed the Sierra Club on Facebook originally just because I I work with plants I love nature it's really important to me so it was just kind of one of the many aware nature awareness kind of groups that I followed I don't think I even really knew necessarily totally what it was about but I liked the information that I got from it and then the 2016 election happened and I found myself really angry and disillusioned and just kind of helpless feeling and I also found myself in a unique position with a lot of um, especially family members who seem to have very different views than I did. And I was ha having a really hard time figuring out how to engage with them at that time. Um, but I knew that we all really loved nature and that that was like a really safe space to kind of be like, whoa, okay. Like things are very different than I thought. And we, I would almost not be able to talk to, you know, some of my family members at that point because it was just such a shock to the system and so upsetting that I, I needed to find some type of balance um, to be able to feel like there were ways to move forward despite what I knew was going to be ongoing oppression, both for myself and nature and a lot of people, including my loved ones with different views, um, whether they knew it or not. <laughs> and so um, I, I knew I just needed to get more involved. And so I reached out to the Sierra Club, to, I think I just filled out a form in terms of like a volunteer interest form and submitted my different interest groups. 
Um, and then I came in and did a one-on-one -on -one interview with you, Kim. And uh, I think I, I started out just like, stuffing envelopes right like actually I think that's where I ended up I know it, it wasn't even didn't even start with you I started out just stuffing envelopes and like filling things I was like I don't know I just need to be a, a part of something feeling like I'm making a difference um so I was just like in the office stuffing envelopes minding my own business and you came and talked to me a little bit and you were like actually I think you're gonna be better over here <laughs> um so you did a one-on-one -on -one interview with me and really just kind of talked to me more about my specific interests um I do remember coming to a was it the summit meeting I think that had like all sorts of different tables about all sorts of different interest groups within the Sierra Club because there's so many ways that you can apply your interest potentially within this one organization um and I just remember that I you know I checked I was like yeah wolves are awesome and pollinators are awesome and like you know, whatever, like I would love to work with any of these things. And, but you were just incredibly intentional with me um, and, you know, kind of saw my giftings in, and interests in different things and um, just kind of led me in the right direction, which was really awesome. That's how I got involved with our Wild America. Um, and it was just such a dynamic group. We were doing lots of like wilderness happy hours and things just like organizing events at like bars and like hanging out having a, a beer talking about how much we love nature and what we could do to protect it and stuff so it was a good way to connect with other people with similar interests which was really nice um and it just kind of snowballed from there I really loved how it was a national organization that really seemed like it could have a, a real impact on things. Like I knew that even though I was just one small, tiny bit of it, that like what I was doing was contributing to a much larger, um, you know, thing that was real, that I, I really believed could make a difference in a time where I felt incredibly angry and hopeless otherwise. Um, so it was pretty hard not to cling to that <laughs> overall. Um, but it also just afforded me a lot of really unique opportunities. Like the more that I was invested in being a part of things, um, you know, we, we went and did different like leadership or treats and things like that, like getting to go as a group to the YMCA of the Rockies and really just like go on some hikes and like brainstorm and talk about how we wanted to try to affect the future and like what were those pathways and like what is every step in between not just having these dreams but like wanting to pursue it and to pursue it equitably and really like how focused they were on inclusivity and really recognizing their past wrongs and you know like problematic aspects because it's an old organization it's been around for so long it's like it's hard not to have done things that are not approved of now at that point. But regardless of the fact that other people might have done that, there was a lot of like ownership and how are we trying to change this? And we're going to be super open and upfront about it. Um, and it was just really dynamic, like experiencing nature with other people and, you know, just trying to learn and be better together. Learning to tell my story better was really big to be like, how do I talk to people about this, but do it well, instead of just blurt emotions <laughs> at people. Um, and I even got to go to Washington DC and, and, you know, learn on a totally different level and be afforded an opportunity that I never would have dreamed of being able to have otherwise and just like really feeling like I could be an agent of change and it was with a group that was going to continue to be self-reflective and like never just be like no our way is the right way um you know just always trying to do better and like whether it's writing letters to the editor and legislate le legislative process or leading hikes or talking to people in libraries even you know or teaching or, kids about plants you did that too <laughs> yeah teaching kids about plants yeah I got to go into a school and talk to kids about all sorts of fun ways they could interact with the natural world and plants and they were so stoked on it it was awesome you know and 
I, I didn't totally know. I was like, oh my God, what do I talk to kids about? I don't know. But I love nature enough that it was a good way to try to connect and be like, hey, (laughs) we all, even different, like across age groups and political views, like it's nature is just something that unites um, everyone, I feel like. And it's never been boring. Like there's always new ways you can choose to interact with the Sierra Club. and, And like, if you get tired of one thing, like, they've got another place to plug you in and you're always going to feel appreciated. Like I I always feel appreciated when I show up, even if I don't show up for a little while. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay too. Um, (laughs) I'm curious if you have any experiences like with number three, have you volunteered with an organization before and were there reasons you stayed or didn't stay? You said a lot about staying with Sierra Club. Are there other places where you like didn't want to stay? I agree that uh, um, with what Courtney said earlier of just like, it's easy to find a lot of one-offs of like, oh, this one event um, or something like that, which is great and is empowering. But um, just as she said before too, like that, like ownership, like that sense of like, because I'm continuing to enact things like, I can see more of a difference that I'm making, you know, because so much of the change is incremental. Um, and it, you know, if you, if you only go to one meeting, you, you you don't, sure you showed your support for something, you know, but like it, it's much more of like a drop in the bucket than like the, it just doesn't register on the big picture quite the same way. And so I would just say, um, both the fact that I can, it's something that I can pursue, say, like legislatively and like in being taught how to write a better comment, you know, that is going to get paid more attention to instead of being like batched out, you know, with a bunch of other form emails that maybe they don't actually care as much about what I have to say when I'm protesting something, you know, and um, being given information like that where I can really participate in things politically as well as having like just fun nature hikes where we're just like soaking in the goodness of nature and each other and like companionship in our shared world and like wow you need both of those things for it to stay sustainable because if you just sit out there enjoying it all the time it might be compromised and you don't get to enjoy it anymore, you know, and like you'll regret not being more informed about the political process, whereas the political process makes a big difference in what we're able to enjoy in nature ultimately and isn't taken advantage of, but like is driven by passion and can ultimately that, that there's like a time limit on that because you're just going to burn out after a certain point because it's pressing half the time. (laughs) most of the time. Um, So I don't know. I I think that a lot of it has just been that there, there is that balance of being involved in a variety of ways and not feeling like I'm stuck in any particular position or only being bogged down by one mentality or another. Awesome. Well, thanks both of you for sharing. Um, you make me sound really good at my job. So that's nice. (laughs) Um, Cool. So the next thing we're going to talk about is some best practices. So the nitty gritties and a lot of it is, um, has to do with things that, that you just talked about. So the best practices for following up with potential volunteers. So say, you know, a volunteer signed up um, at an event and said they're interested in volunteering or they filled out a volunteer interest form online. Um, These are some best practices for how to follow up with them. So the first one is um, timing is key. So like I said, whether someone filled out an online interest interest form, checked a box for an email or an event or an outing, um, you should always strive to get back with them within a week. Um, Otherwise, they'll lose interest, you know, Um, you can email, call, text, whatever you feel most comfortable with um, to that person um, to follow up with them. I personally prefer email because I can send them fact sheets and more information about the campaign. But the most key point of this is make sure you follow up with them. um, I say within a week, um, because otherwise, the fact that they signed up to volunteer might go out of their head and they'll be harder to um, get in touch with. Um, The next thing is you want to make sure you have some kind of short explainer or like white page or what fact sheet 
um, about your issue or your campaign or what you want people to volunteer with you on. So uh, you want to figure out how to talk about your work and have some kind of overall goal within one to two sentences. And then you can attach fact sheets or toolkits if you're emailing them information. So you want to have a good short pitch to them about, hey, if you're volunteering with us, this is what we're doing. Um, also, you want to make it personal. And this is actually something that I learned from Amberly because she does this. Um, if you talk to that person before or they filled out an online form with information about themselves, you want to make sure to include in your email that you're reaching out to them um, with or your correspondence um, of why you think they're a good fit for the team um, and why you think that they'll be a great person to have um, joining you. And then also, you want to list a few examples of volunteer tasks. So, um, you know, if you don't have personal info on the interested volunteer, make sure you list out a few things that they can do as a volunteer with your team. So um, generally, you try to tie the tasks in with what you know about that person. But if you don't, you can still list a few tasks like writing letters to the editor, um, writing a comment, writing a letter to the president, you know, small little tasks that they can do right away if they come and volunteer with you. And then also you always wanna end your outreach with an ask. So my usual ask is um, to um, meet with the person one-on-one -on -one so we can get to know each other better. Um, but you can also invite them to an upcoming volunteer team meeting you're having or invite them to an upcoming event. Um, I often throw in an added ask to um, have them take a quick action with the campaign, such as signing an online petition or writing a short comment, just because it gives them a little taste of the work before you meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but anytime you reach out to a volunteer that's showed interest in volunteering, make sure you have an ask of uh, the next step. And then also, um, if they respond, follow up quickly. Don't just leave it there. Um, follow up your follow up, basically. <laughs> So I have in here an example email um, that our team uses when following up with volunteers. Um, and if you're going to uh, be watching this, there'll also be um, these slides um, available for you to look through the slides and click on the email. But just for an example, here is an, a sample email outreach that we, we put together um, for volunteers. Um, basically, it hits all the points, you know, it thanks you for coming to whatever event they came to that they showed interest in volunteering, or you can say, hey, I saw your volunteer intake form, excited that you're interested. Um, you're going to have the ask of, it'd be great to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you're going to have here a few ways volunteers can help out. And then some kind of mention of like the work that you're doing currently. Um, and then a thanks. I look forward to hearing from you soon. So here's a good example, and you'll have access to this, like I said, um, because you'll have access to these slides. Great. So the next step on this is, what are the some types of volunteer engagement? So obviously, a lot of times people will, um, you know, volunteer for different reasons. And here's some some types of volunteer reasons that volunteers might volunteer. Um, with you and um, what that looks like. So first of all, um, sometimes people uh, show up based on the time that they have. So maybe they show up to do short-term volunteering that are really task-centered, or they show up for the long-term and they're really focused on the overall objective or the goal that your campaign is working on. And so like I really said earlier, they put in the patience and the time um, and, um, you know, keep showing up because they want to accomplish that big goal. Um, and also there's people who show up by skill or experience. So they could be a new beginner person who's never really volunteered with an advocacy organization before, or they could be a person who's volunteered a lot, who maybe have, has even been on boards with the Sierra Club before. Um, also people just show up by motivation. Um, they're, you know, here because they care about the issue, but they don't really know um, how to do so. They don't really know how to help out. So it's important to have a planned path of engagement to offer these folks that helps them gain confidence and experience as they go. So for example, when someone takes on a short term or smaller commitment, you want to be prepared to ask them to take on something with a deeper level of commitment next time if they want to. Um, so basically, you want to be prepared to accommodate all levels and types of engagement, but 
don't try to fit people into these places. Don't try to fit circles into squares. The key is really to provide the right kind of support along the pathways of engagement for volunteers. And um, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. All right, more best practices. So you get a volunteer to show up. How do you keep them volunteering? Well, there are a few tips that I've learned over the years to help um, keep people engaged um, with your work. Um, the first one is to be consistent and organized. So um, this is my biggest thing when it comes to volunteering with an organization. I've left um, volunteer uh, volunteering for places because they just weren't that organized um, because it stresses me out um, when things aren't organized. So consistency is key for a volunteer to continue engaging with your team. So a good tip is to set up a monthly meeting and make sure it happens whether there's really much to discuss or not. You know, people can come and join as they wish, but it's just really good to have that like landing space for folks every month. Um, this helps folks feel like they have a commitment to their teammates and also to you. Um, it also helps build relationships amongst your team. Um, that's really important. Also, um, you want to try to stay organized as possible. So be available to volunteers, have dedicated times for meetings, or um, create a doodle poll for the meeting. Um, you can also create a spreadsheet with everyone's contact information, um, as long as people are okay with sharing that. Um, you can create a listserv for the team to communicate or Google group or Slack or whatever works for you. It's just a good place for everybody to communicate and share updates, et cetera. Um, and also, you know, having a, a list or a way to communicate is really um, important for both the team, but also for you, because you want to be able to communicate with this big group of people um, regularly. Um, and so the next thing is you want to be understanding. Like volunteers are doing just that, they are volunteering. And volunteers come in a lot of different packages and it's important to be understanding of others' time restraints and of your own. Um, I'm always just happy to have these volunteers when they can be there. <laughs> um, so them coming to your meetings or doing tasks is already 100% more engaged than most people. So um, always be understanding of, of your volunteers' time. And then also you wanna create a welcoming space. Um, so this is really key for volunteer engagement, whether it's on the computer or in person, every volunteer team should have a list of group agreements or norms or expectations. And there's a link of an example in, in this slide. Um, having this sets up the team with a mutual understanding and how we will work together and conduct our meetings. And you also wanna make sure you develop these as a team. This is something that everybody should have input into. Um, also, if the meeting is in person, a uh, really good tip, bring food, bring drinks, meet in a nice neutral space. Um, libraries are great. Um, <laughs> it's always nice to um, come together with food or drinks as a team. Good way to bond, good, good way to build relationships. Um, the next thing is you want to make sure a volunteer's first experience with the team is a positive one. Um, so, you know, make sure that people are um, having a good experience, they're feeling welcome in the space. That's definitely like a basic 101 of making sure a volunteer stays around. <laughs> um, the next is you don't wanna overcommit people. Um, sometimes people are hesitant to say no as volunteers. They wanna help with everything because they care so much about the issue. Um, so you wanna try to support them as they try on a new commitment, but you know, you want to find out if they can, they actually have the capacity to add it to their list and, and not overcommit them to something that um, they get really stressed that they actually can't accomplish. Um, also, you want to listen to input and su suggestions from volunteers. So listening is a key, you know, listening is key in any relationship and is especially key when working in a vol volunteer environment. Um, listening to input and suggestions are an important piece to keeping a volunteer engaged. So you want to try to do what you can to address their input and suggestions or explain kindly why that might not work for this team. Um, it can go both ways. <laughs> um, you also want to cultivate a team environment of culture and accountability. So you want to have a sense of belonging to your team. You know, we're all here for the same reason. We're going to set a vision for our advocacy work together as a team. And um, by doing so, a sense of accountability will come in naturally as your team builds trust with one another. And then also, um, just a, 
don't just stick to work gatherings, have some fun, you know, do fun stuff. It's harder in this um, time period that we're in, but it still is important to take some time for relationship building, even when we're all just staring at each other on our computers. <laughs> um, and then the last tip is using a leadership pathway, which is something that I'm gonna go over in a couple slides. So here's just a really fun um, example of how to how people tend to overcommit volunteers. So we've got a team meeting here. Um, Sally is new to the Sierra Club. This is her first meeting. Um, the person leading the meeting is thinking, "Ha, huh, we really need a conservation chair, which is a very big volunteer leadership role." And then they, you know, come right out and say, "Well, Sally doesn't have." anything to do. Um, maybe she'd like to be our new conservation chair. So that's a huge ask for a volunteer who just showed up. Um, what would be better to do is, you know, thank Sally for coming. Um, you know, say it was great to meet you. Uh, you seem really excited about the rally we're doing next week or whatever thing you have coming up. Would you be able to make a few calls to get people there? A very small ask that somebody can do. And um, generally, that's that's a better way to start people engaging instead of just immediately saying, hey, do you want to be like a leader in the Sierra Club after your first meeting? Not generally the best way to handle it. <laughs> Cool. So um, next we're going to talk about leadership pathways. So leadership pathways um, enable you to uh, create meaningful volunteer opportunities, uh, match volunteer interests with roles. It helps you cultivate leadership and it also um, helps you plan strategically. So um, leadership pathways um, really help you be two steps ahead whenever possible. So when someone is at an event where they're learning about something that's new to them and they're excited to take action, um, they are already thinking about what's next. So you should always be thinking about what's next for them. And that's where leadership pathways come in. Um, so this next slide is one of my favorite uh, examples of leadership pathway. Um, so when I think of a leadership pathway, I think of the game Candyland. So you're traveling along a path and you're stopping along the way to explore different parts of the, um, you know, this lovely candy world. Um, however, in this in this version, um, you want to forget that the player's objective is to get to the castle and um, the players don't necessarily have to follow what the cards tell them. They can be their own game maker. So here's your path of a volunteer. Um, so the good things about Candyland and how we think of it is that you can move in both directions on the board. So a volunteer could be, you know, really far ahead in their volunteer pathway and then say, hey, you know, I didn't think I was quite ready for that. I need to step back and work on this. Or, you know, two or more players can be in the same place um, at the same time. So you can create some teamwork there. Um, there are shortcuts for moving across the the path. So, you know, say someone took a small ask and they, they have experience on um, in communications or something like that, and they want to take a bigger role of like drafting a press release, you're probably going to jump them across the path there. Um, and also there are in Candyland, the licorice spaces that slow you down, which is real life. Volunteers live in real life. We all live in real life. They can get slowed down in their path um, with your team. And that's, that's okay. So the next slide is an example of a leadership pathway for a volunteer. Um, this is specific to uh, doing um, communications. So um, if one of my objectives for this campaign is to get six media hits per month, so get us mentioned or get an LTE published um, uh, six times per month. Um, so. You know, you want to start here with something small, like writing a letter to the editor. Then you can move into them drafting samples letter to the editor. Then maybe they could recruit folks um, to write letters to the editor, et cetera, et cetera. And you go up the board. But I think an important thing to note here is that all along this pathway, there are these points here where, you know, whoever is the leader of the team is training and coaching and checking back in with this volunteer to make sure that they feel comfortable with their the path that they're doing, see if they need to step back, see what support they need. Um, that's really, really key is to make sure you're always checking in with this person as you give them more tasks or move them along the leadership pathway. 
All right, I have been talking a ton. Um, so, uh, you know, just wanted to see if y'all had any questions after I went through all of that. <laughs> I guess I'd be just like curious how you found like figuring out people's limits or or way they'd be most interested in helping out um, in the past. Because I know I've been in, in like the experience where like to be like on a more like formal team or something like that has generally gone like I'm filling out a form or I'm reaching out to someone myself and then can kind of like share what I'm most interested in. But then on the other end, there's been times when I've been approached to, you know, perhaps not have a longer volunteer commitment, but write a letter or something like that. And I have found people to be a little pushy and maybe I ended up doing what was asked of me. It was like left kind of like not feeling great about it at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's really important. I, I guess the way that I've always approached that is really um, just listening to folks, you know, like really asking, um, you know, if someone agrees to do something that they've maybe not done before, you're not aware if they've done before, just make sure that you're available to support them when they give it a try. I think is, you know, just making that expectation clear. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah. And then also it's, yeah, it's really about listing. And then I think it's also really important to have a strong understanding of what you like the vision of your work is and like what you want to accomplish and, and listen to the person's skills and what they're interested in and then come back and think, okay, like what would be a good fit for this person? So like, say it's someone who, um, is really interested in like, policy and, and stuff like that. Like, oh, this person might be good to help me research or put together a document on this thing. Or it's someone like, like, you know, um, Amberly who had experience in like understanding um, plants and stuff like that. And we were like, oh, we want to do some education. She's also very artsy. So it was like, let's create some like art for people to do that has to do with plants. Um, and we did it at events. So, you know, it's really listening and being creative and then making sure that you're, you offer the support to be there for that person when they agree to do the task and making that really clear. I feel like we miss out on that a lot is we don't make it really clear that that person is asking you for, you know, if you want to do it. And then if you agree being like, oh, but I'm actually here to support you, like whatever you need to make sure that you feel comfortable doing this. Um, yeah, I'm here. That makes sense. Any other questions? Um, I guess it would just mostly be about, um, you know, how things have pivoted during COVID and then like hypothetically starting to exit that phase of life. But um, I mean, it's, it, it's definitely been helpful to do some things online, obviously. And then I also very much miss, you know, a lot of the dynamics, you know, of just in-person stuff. Um, do you think that there will continue to be kind of like a hybrid model going forth of like potentially both of those things? Like I know that there didn't used to be as much online stuff, but it does seem like that's another really great way to get people involved in a way that is approachable to them without having to have certain in-person deadlines or things. So just like going forward oppor opportunities with the CR club is my curiosity, I suppose. Yeah, I think, you know, it definitely has been a challenge since we were all very used to doing in-person events and using that as a way to bring people in and, you know, meeting regularly in person and, and things like that. Um, but there is an advantage to it in the fact that, you know, Courtney doesn't live in Denver, but she still can join our, our meetings and have the same experience that others are having. Um, so I think that's an advantage that's going to continue in terms of the hybrid of like folks meeting from across the state um 
to, you know, plan and, and work together on conservation goals in Colorado. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I do think there is some limitations because there's not as much of the like feel of us being, you know, in harmony together. But I'm hoping maybe there will be similar, you know, meetings digitally, but then like once a year, everybody still goes to the YMCA together from across the state and has, you know, a weekend of doing advocacy training and planning. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I feel like that um, that's where we're headed. And I think there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, but I do like, you know, the concept that um, the public lands team in Colorado is putting together of, you know, making sure that there's some like relationship building time at the beginning of the meeting. It's not just everybody get on your Zoom and like start talking about, you know, Sierra Club conservation goals. Let's spend a little bit of time getting to know each other too. Um, I think that's really important and would advocate for all volunteer teams that are still recruiting new people during this time um, to make sure they're building that into their um their meetings and their times together is that relationship building that's really exciting honestly i feel like one of the larger problems we kept encountering was you know we we live in a geographically large state um, and that was one of the things that was impressed on me when we went to you know dc is on the east coast they were like oh, we have no problem getting volunteers to events because everybody's so close to anything, um, you know? And we were like, oh, people we like are like five hours away. <laughs> and it's just like, we have a lot of people that are excited, but it makes engagement that much more complicated or just like smaller groups of people. So I love the idea that there's going to be other ways to get together in person going forward, but it seems like video chatting is a fantastic way to be able to partner with people in other, you know, parts of the state and nation to really be able to combine perspectives and unite different initiatives, even though the in-person events can be more complicated for that. And, um, oh God, I just hope for in-person events again soon. That's me that's too. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's also, this time has, has gotten, you know, it's made me think more creatively about well, what do folks need to like be able to come together in a way, but also bring more people with them, you know, from their own community. And so we're coming up with new ways of creating toolkits, like advocacy toolkits that volunteers can take and go, oh, this is how I could like talk to somebody else in my community about this, or this is how I can invite them to a meeting or set up a meeting or things like that. So like toolkits plus support um, to give people more opportunities to distributely organize on um, a campaign in their state and then kind of come together as like a bigger statewide team. And then, you know, we talked about the snowflake model before um, in uh, like other trainings that we've done. But yeah, um, that's kind of the idea. And I think that's made me think more creatively of like, like, what are the basics that people need to be able to do this in their own communities without having a staff member there, without having the ability to have um, in, an event or things like that. So yeah, it's it's been really interesting. And um, I think it'll, I hope it'll be, create some really great results. So. All right, any other questions? Well, thank you guys. Um, appreciate it. Uh, hopefully this training will help everybody who watches this um, learn more about volunteers um, and keeping volunteers around. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach me um, at my email. It's kim.pope at sierraclub.org. And um, thank you all. Appreciate it.